an introduction. My name is Dave Blake. I'm the founder and CEO of Client Success. And uh, we'll bring in the person who needs no introduction, Christy Fauci-Russo, our chief customer officer. I'm so excited to say that um, as she was promoted. Hear it. <laughs> she was promoted recently, but Christy, how you doing? I'm good. Actually, you know what? I'm like happy, sad. Um, today's my one year anniversary at mm. Client Success. So super, super excited about that. But it's the last of this series, uh, and so kind of bummed. I always hate, I always hate the last uh, webinar in any of our series. So happy, sad, more happy than sad. Yes, we're happy. Um, we're happy that you to celebrate your one year anniversary here at Client Success and all that you've done here and in the community. We're happy to celebrate your your promotion to Chief Customer Officer. And we're, I think I can speak for everybody online, we're super happy to hear another webinar series uh, for you. So today we're talking about onboarding, right? Yeah, and so this one is like, all right, I wanna be very specific about why I chose this. This isn't necessarily like how to design any onboarding. This is specific around designing something that's flexible. Um, Dave, I'm sure you've seen in your career, right? I know that I've seen in mine. In fact, I've designed these where they are a one size fits all model, right? You create one onboarding, it's very specific, you know, very checklist focused. We're gonna do these things by this date. And once we're done, right, the customer is done and we kind of shuffle them along. And I, I've been on the receiving end of that and can say, wow, what a horrible experience. But I know our customers also don't love that either. So this is all about how do you create something that can be flexible, but scale? And I think that's what everyone needs to figure out, right? Is like, how do you incorporate the two? Because scale is important but you've got to design something that meets your customers' needs and expectations. Definitely. That's taking the outside in approach and building an onboarding experience that will be beneficial for the customer, not necessarily just beneficial for you. So I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing about it. Um, as usual, I'll be on chat, managing chat and the Q&A. Uh, we'll let Christy take it over here and then I'll be back to, to facilitate a Q&A at the end. So uh, take it away, Christy. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. And again, guys, please, um, you can drop questions in the chat. Like I always say, I'm not the only expert here. I know all of you are experts in your own right. So please ask each other questions. But if there are specific questions you'd like for me to answer during our Q&A portion, please put those in the Q&A in the Zoom so we can get to those. So just appreciate that. Um, all right. So we're going to get into this. Like I said, this is all about executing a flexible and repeatable onboarding framework. So this isn't going to be your standard generic, like how do you create an onboarding framework or why is onboarding important? We'll talk about that a little bit too, but more importantly, how do you include that flexibility? Um, so let's get started. Hopefully there's nobody on this call that I have to convince or anybody who tunes in in the future, nobody that I have to convince that onboarding is important, right? We have one time to make a first impression. This basically will help support the long-term success of your customer. Um, originally, I think I used the word insure, but we know there's so many variables um, that I, I couldn't say insure, right? Because I'm not that confident, but I definitely can attest to the fact that if you've got a strong, well thought out, well executed onboarding that really helps set your customers up to succeed in the partnership, they're going to experience long-term success with that partnership, which means hopefully a lot of growth. And that's what we're all working towards, right? We want we want these relationships, these partnerships we have with our customers to be mutually beneficial. And in order to be mutually beneficial, right, our customers have to get what they need from the partnership in exchange for us to get what we want, which is hopefully that continued longevity in the partnership and hopefully long-term growth. So it's so critical that we figure this out. Um, you know, there, there's tons of folks and resources that, resources that are pioneering um, you know, the importance of a customer onboarding, our dear friend Donna Weber, she wrote a book, Onboarding Matters. It absolutely matters. Go check out her book if you haven't already. Great read. Um, but it's really just so critical for us to figure this out because more often than not, we, we try to create this one size fits all onboarding experience. And guess what? That just doesn't work. Um, onboarding is not a one size fits all program. And forget organization to organization, right? I could definitely not take the onboarding that I had built out at, at previous organizations and come to client success and deploy that. It wouldn't work, right? So if you're a leader who said, oh, well, you know, I've built onboarding before, easy peasy. I'm just going to take what I did and bring it along and deploy that same program. You're probably going to fail. Um, and I know that because I've tried that because who wouldn't try that, right? It seems like an easy, an easy way to have a quick win, right? Oh, something worked here. It's going to work again. Um, I can attest and can share stories, uh, privately uh, about how I've tried to do that and why and, and how they felt. So what I will tell you is customer onboarding is specific, right? And you know how I, I all, I always say it depends. 
this is a huge, it depends, right? Because your customer onboarding program depends. It depends on your customers. It depends on your product, the complexity, the resource allocation, right? Um, there's so many factors that go into this. Even if you think about your customers across various industries or their maturation, right? Maybe you have a customer who's deployed software, your same software, like four times, you know, four times over in their career, and they don't need you as much as a customer who maybe this is the first time that they're dipping their toe into this. So you really have to think about creating an onboarding experience that does have that flexibility because you're not meeting everyone at the same place, right? And everybody needs something slightly different. So it's important for you to think about all the variables and design an onboarding program that almost feels like a little bit like a buffet, right? You can pull in certain things as you need based off of your customer and who they are and where they're starting from. And so please, again, don't, don't assume that what works somewhere else will work here. Don't assume that because you've designed a solid onboarding program for one cohort or tranche of your customers that it's gonna work for all of them. Guess what? Your SMB customers might need something very different than your enterprise. So you have to think about designing it based on that criteria. Um, so please lean in and think about this um, as you're, you're going through your program with your customers. Now, the next thing is I want to talk about onboarding the customer lifecycle. Um, if you attended last week's session when we talked about renewing uh, renewals, right? I talked about renewals in the customer lifecycle. Well, today I'm going to talk about onboarding in the customer lifecycle because I think all of these things are important, right? And nothing stops, starts and stops in the same place. For us, again, this is an example of the client success customer lifecycle. Um, and so this is the journey we go on with our customers as their partners of ours um, and how we help manage them through, right? So our first stage is all about alignment. And so when we think about how that impacts our customers onboarding, it's all about setting expectations. Expectations around the partnership, the product, our process, our people, how we're gonna work together, how do we ensure mutual success? Um, and so our first stage, all about alignment, but that alignment helps set us up for the onboarding program. Now, stage two for us is all about execution. And that really is the core of that is our onboarding. And so this is where we're setting our customers up for success. Again, if we've designed our onboarding program effectively, our customers should come out of onboarding feeling well-equipped to independently use the solution, right? To focus on their goals, their needs, but independently use it. Now, stage three, which we call our realized stage, right? It's all about the realization of value. We continue to optimize. Right? We don't assume that because we onboard our customers that the kind of learning has completed. Our product you know, can do a lot of different things. It has a lot of different use cases. And so what we do in onboarding is a small subset of that. And so for us, our realized phase actually is, it feels like a continuation of that. Because it's not only optimizing what we've currently deployed, but it's also now focusing on other modules, other components, different use cases to really help our customers maximize that value, right? So onboarding is very finite in the sense that for us, it's all about getting them set up with a platform in a way that aligns to some of their core focus areas, their, their objectives, and we'll talk about that. Um, and so once we get them there, it's not like we stop, but we say, you know what, based on what we've defined as onboarding, can you confirm that you feel empowered to independently use the product and move forward. Great, onboarding can be completed, let's move on. But we continue to work together. Now, we have a higher engagement model with a lot of our customers, so we're meeting with them on a pretty regular basis. Now, not everyone can do that, right? So again, this is where you have to take into consideration your engagement model with your customers, your bandwidth to do and support something that would continue through the life cycle. But for us, it does continue. And then our stage four here around advocacy really focuses on the socialization of a material win. Right, something, something big, something special that ties back to what our customers set on to accomplish when they came into the partnership. So we're really big about kind of following the life cycle of not only the stages through our journey, right, but also how our customers are seeing success. And a lot of that all works together. Now, when I think about designing onboarding, um, I broke it down into four different areas of focus, and this is how I would approach it. Um, a lot of Ds on this slide, so you're gonna get define, determine, design, deliver, and I'll, and I'll break this down for you. Um, but the first one here is all about defining it. More often than not, when I speak to leaders, I speak to friends, colleagues in this space, and I ask them to define what it means to be fully onboarded with their solution, I don't really get clear answers. I definitely probably don't get the same answer from multiple people. Um, really, this is all about defining, like, what does it mean to be onboarded on your product, 
right? What does that look like? Not from a checklist standpoint or like we need our customers to do these things, but for your customer to come in and make use of your product in a way that's going to help them achieve their goals. What does that mean? What does that look like? So if you haven't taken a moment to actually go through that exercise of defining that, I'd highly recommend it because this is like setting your, your, your values, right? In your company, like your vision, your mission, it's the same thing, right? Defining what this means is going to help drive all of the things that you do from there. So if you don't have a clear definition of what that means, you can't build a program because you don't know where you're going. So take a minute and go back to the beginning and say, what does it mean to be onboarded with our solution? And if you ask that and come up with a very clear answer, that's great. Now make sure the rest of your program goes ahead and supports that. The next area here is determine, right? This is where you're gonna have to determine what is it gonna take to get to that state of onboarded? Um, now you have a very clear understanding of what it means, how you're going to get there, right? What are the things that you're going to have to incorporate as part of your program to help get your customers to that point? The next one here is all about designing this. Now, once you have all the pieces and say, great, okay, we know they have to do these 12 things to get to the state of onboarded, you have to design that, right? This is program design. You're orchestrating your customers through a, an engagement on itself, right? Onboarding could be its own, its own life cycle. Um, and in fact, in many organizations, it is. So you have to design it as such, right? What is that process your customers will go through in order to have a very positive experience that will help them get to that state, that defined state of onboarded? And then the last thing is that delivering, right? So once you've defined it, you determined what's a part of it, you've designed it, you've got to deliver it. But delivering doesn't mean, great, we did this thing and we're going to go roll it out to everybody and that's our program and we're good to go. You've got to start to, to kind of roll this out in a, in a way that's going to allow you to iterate and make some changes because I guarantee you the first iteration of your onboarding program will not go smooth. Uh, I guarantee that you will learn a lot and your customers will be more than happy to share some feedback. You gotta take that in, you gotta internalize it. And don't forget your customers aren't the only ones that will have some feedback for you. Um, if you're working and your customer success management team is the one who's orchestrating onboarding, lean into them, right? Hear from them, what's working well, what's not, where are their points of friction? Where can we enhance the experience for our customers? And then also, obviously, like I said, it could be it could be another team. It could be your onboarding team. It could be professional services team. Um, whoever is executing that program, it's important to work collaboratively with them. Now, if you're a CS leader and you've got another part of your organization who's managing this, I would definitely recommend working together. Right, that cross-functional collaboration, regardless of who owns it, is critical. Right, because you're all working towards the same core objective, which is helping your customers get set up to succeed long term. So work together, learn together. Um, I will tell you as a customer success leader who in the past, I didn't own onboarding in some of my roles and that was owned by another part of the business. What I actually learned is that that collaboration was so key because what we learned on the kind of the second half of that partnership, right? When the customers were out of onboarding, customers who didn't have certain things configured had a lower success rate or customers who were set up a certain way had a much higher success rate, right? So we learned a lot. We had a lot of insights. So if our onboarding team just created this without our collaboration, right? They'd be missing the mark, right? They'd think, oh, okay, yep, nope, customers onboarded, we feel good, great, send them along. But the reality of it is we're, we're learning and seeing a lot. So it's important to make sure that you're all sharing those insights and realizing that those insights aren't just captured from one team. So you've gotta be able to come back and iterate on that a bit. So these are the four steps that we're gonna go through. I'm gonna take a moment and kind of walk you through the thought process about how you should be approaching these. So starting with define, right? It is so critical for you to map out how you're going to, like, what does this mean? Not only just what does onboarding mean, right? But like, what does that mean from a people, process, and technology standpoint? Um, get that clear perspective of what it means to be onboarded from your solution, because it's going to be key to have all three of those elements mapped out as part of that definition, right? Because onboarding isn't just about your platform configuration or data ingestion, it's at the end of the day, it's can, can humans, can humans drive change as a result of the program that you've just walked them through? Um, and that's what we're doing, right? This is all about change management. So your onboarding shouldn't be so heavily product focused, right? With a lack of understanding of what is the process change that's gonna need to happen in their organization in order to adopt this effectively, right? This is about change management. So you've gotta be thinking bigger about this. This is not about your product exclusively. And it, it's 
mainly about your customer's ability to drive the change internally, right? So, so much of your success as a technology provider relies on your customer's ability to go drive that change internally. So mapping this out should not just look like an internal definition. It should really feel like, what does it mean for your customer to be fully onboarded, right? So you should be thinking about it through those two lenses of both what, what would it mean, right, as an expert internally in your solution for your customers to be onboarded, but then what is it going to mean from their perspective? I'd also say that you need to make sure that your onboarding process supports your core business use cases, um, right? Probably out there, your marketing team is doing a great job um, telling the world about all the problems that your solution solves, right? And all the time it gives back and all the money it can make or save, um, all the human capital it can preserve. These are all great. Right. But if your onboarding doesn't really map back to those things, it's a huge disconnect, right? Because your customers are coming on board because they were sold what's possible, right? Somebody in the sales organization helped them understand and see a vision of what is possible in their business as a result of using your product. Your onboarding needs to encompass that, right? That vision. It has to make them feel like when they're done, they're going to be able to tackle those problems effortlessly. So you've got to be thinking about it through that lens too, right? Does everything we're doing in our onboarding support the core use cases or the challenges that our marketing and our sales team is pitching, right? Because there's got to be that alignment. This is oftentimes where you feel a disconnect in that process. You've also got to spend time defining those success milestones. Success of onboarding doesn't just mean we've completed and your customer has something tangible at the end, right? There's successes along the way. And again, because we're driving change management and change management is hard, you need to find wins that you can celebrate and socialize to keep the momentum going. So figure out what are those key milestones, right? As you're progressing. For us, it could be like, hey, we've got their, all their data ingested, right? And we've got all their integrations done. Yay, that is a big win because now we're, we're kind of breaking down the barriers around democratization of data. That could be huge, right? That could be a milestone. Figure out what those are, right? And then make sure that you're celebrating them along with your customers. But once they're defined, it'll help guide your program. And then understand that onboarding can look very different. I mentioned this earlier. You're going to have different customer segments, different types, different industries. They are in different places in their life. <laughs> and so making sure that your onboarding, onboarding program, even how it's defined, speaks to that in its totality. So really thinking through all of that. Now, once you've defined what it looks like, now we're going to go into determining what those steps are. So the first thing you need to do is start with mapping out the steps to get your customer onboarded. Right. For us, if we're thinking about our program, there could be certain modules within our solution that we say, you know what, in order for our customer to get to the state of good, effective onboarding, they need to do these things. Right. We know this to be true based off of the use cases they'd come in with, based off of how they're going to be able to drive value. Um, right. There's certain elements of things that have to happen. And so make sure that you're very clear on mapping those out. Then you need to figure out and understand where your customers are starting from and if this is going to impact their experience. Now, this goes back to the fact that I said some people are going to be in different cohorts. So it could be you've got SMB and you've got enterprise, right? And you probably have a couple of things in between. But how is your onboarding going to look and how do you shape it to support those different experiences? For some organizations, perhaps you're selling onboarding and others, maybe you're not. It's just a part of your package. Well, if you're selling it, right, there should be some real tangible value. You can't just have a set it and forget it program where it's self-enabled and self-guided, but then charge for it. So you've got to figure out based on where our customers are, based on our solution, based on its complexity, the work that needs to happen, what's got to go into that. Next, you've got to determine the methods you're going to leverage to execute onboarding. For some people, you're going to have one-to-one -one sessions. Maybe it's one-to-many. There is group onboarding I've seen done and executed well. Perhaps there is, it's almost exclusively on, on uh, self-guided onboarding with a little bit of like a um, one-to-many collaboration. Uh, maybe there's video, maybe it's asynchronous, right? What is the best method for you to go and execute your program. Um, it doesn't need to be one-to-one, -one, right? There's so many things that technology helps support these days that you've got to figure out what is the best way for you to think about creating this flexible, scalable approach and then leveraging all the me mechanisms and methods that you can to execute. And then lastly, you need to understand what needs to happen on their end and what needs to happen on your end, right? These, This is important, right? What is your customer going to need to be doing 
to effectively get on board? And then what are we as a team going to need to do to effectively onboard our customer, right? There's, there's different work that's involved for our customers. Perhaps they're doing a lot of work outside of these working sessions. Maybe they have to go through certification. Maybe they have to go watch videos or read a manual or, or go do things, right? But you've got to be very clear in understanding, hey, these are the things that our customers will need to do in order to onboard. But then what are the things that we're going to need to do to help onboard them, right? So it's going to be probably some very prescriptive meetings that you'll have, or again, like I said, these one-to-many workshops, or preparing and, and creating assets and materials that'll help them with the self-guided experience. Again, it doesn't matter, but you need to determine what are the things that both parties have to do. Onboarding is not a one-sided experience, right? Your customers are equally accountable for their success. We're here to help guide and enable and train and set them up for that success, but the work has to be done on their end. And you also have to be very clear about conveying that message up front because sometimes it's easy for your customers to think, oh, well, that my vendor is going to onboard me, right? And all the work falls on them and we'll, we'll be set up in a couple of weeks because that's what my salesperson told me to. Um, you need to be very clear in distinguishing the roles that each party is going to play. And so mapping those out is critical. Now we'll move to the design part. Um, this is probably the part that I like the most uh, of creating any onboarding program. I think the core elements that you incorporate are really critical, but getting to a place where you're designing this is actually where I think the beauty lies in an onboarding program, because this is the experience, right? And the experience isn't just these meetings or just the engagements that you've proactively orchestrated, right? Whether it's asynchronously or through video or whatever, right? It's all the things that happen in between all of those things, right? It's it's accounting for the, the experience in its totality and creating something that feels seamless and something that feels really positive, um, easy, right? This is what our customers want and what they deserve, quite frankly. So first thing you need to do is you have to design that onboarding journey based on the elements that you've determined, right? So you've already said, these are the core building blocks that we're going to have to incorporate in our program. Great. Now you need to start to map those out. Um, it's important to make sure that you've got all these things in an order that makes sense, right? You need to make sure that things are happening in a particular sequence. Sometimes there is parts of your solution, right? You can't do Z before you've done ABC, right? You've got to do certain things in an order. If that's the case, right? You need to make sure that you're structuring your program in a way that's going to help support that. Um, but in other cases, maybe there's certain things you can run in parallel or move things around. Again, this is where you having a creative and flexible mindset is going to be really critical to your success because you're thinking about it not just by what you and your customers need to do, uh, right, but like what is going to be their experience and how can we enhance this and how can we accelerate it? The next part is preparing all the assets. Um, I will tell you our, our onboarding as we are rolling out a newer version of this now has so many assets that go along with it because we want to make sure that we're providing our customers with a multitude of resources in different formats. We've got written, we've got video. So we're creating all of these types of resources and assets, even templates, uh, decks, Excel sheets. And the reason we're doing that is because we want our customers to feel empowered right? You don't need to wait till your next meeting with your CSM or your onboarding manager or your professional services person, right? If you are somebody who wants to accelerate your experience independently, well, we want to give you the tools to do that. Again, this is where you're creating this flexible environment to help, help your customers help themselves. And so we're rethinking all of the assets that we have in support of our onboarding program. We're redesigning them, we're rethinking them, and we're creating them through so many different methods and mechanisms because again, we want people to consume information the way they want to consume it. For some people, it's short form video clips. For some people, they want to go through a webinar, right, where it's a step-by-step -step tutorial. Other people want to read a guide and pull that up and kind of map through their, the product themselves. Whatever their experience needs to be for them, that's what we want to create. And so again, thinking about this in a way that's flexible, you're creating this in a way that allows your customers to, to work the way that they want to work, right? We do a lot of things where we are working hand in hand with our customers, right? Our trainings that we do during our onboarding aren't, you know, point and click showing you, right? It's not a walkthrough. It's really helping them in a workshop fashion, configure the platform in a way that makes sense. And so that really helps them get started. But oftentimes that's just what we're doing, right? We're getting started. So the customer needs to continue on that themselves independently, right? Maybe they're doing some homework in between, which is great, but you got to give them assets so they can continue to do that independently. Map out a tentative timeline um, and a game plan for the process. But what I will say about this is please, your timeline is your timeline. It's something you can talk to your customers about, but do not say that your customer is onboarded when they've hit a certain time because that is how you're structuring it. 
right? Do not structure your onboarding that says, nope, onboarding ends on day 90. If your customer is not ready at day 90, which could be for a ton of different reasons, and hopefully reasons you've addressed throughout the process, but that doesn't mean you cut them off, right? If your role is to help make sure that your customers are successful, um, cutting them off and creating an experience where you're saying, nope, sorry, this was your timeline. We didn't need it. We're done. is crazy. Um, so please also think about a timeline should be something loose to guide your customer along, right? Most customers complete this by this time, but internally you could be using a timeline and the timeline internally should be used as points of intervention, right? And so this is my, my final bullet here is create these intervention plans for when things don't go wrong. Your timeline should be more internal than it is external, right? It should be something for your team to pay attention to, not a forcing function to drive your team's behavior, but rather something to say, hmm, you know what? Usually majority of our customers can get to a certain milestone in this journey by X date. We're now X days past that. This is probably a bit concerning. We're not getting the responsiveness. We're not getting the engagement, right? Our customers aren't doing their homework, right? So we can lean in and intervene and have conversations around What's, what's preventing us from advancing, right? What's slowing us down? But at no point should your program be so rigid that you can't, you can't be flexible, right? And so this is what it's all about, about creating that flexibility. But it, it, you'd, be, you'd be surprised how many companies I've seen and how many people have talked to you that, nope, these are the days, right? This is, we've got six weeks, we've got to do it in six weeks, that's it, we don't have a minute longer, got to be handed off, right? These are our, our dashboards and we can't have anything go awry. It's just, you've got to create internal processes that can be more nimble and agile and the experience be flexible for your customer. The last thing here is delivering. Um, I would absolutely figure out and identify some cohorts of customers to test your new program with. In fact, if you've got some friendly uh, customers or some pro you know, new customers coming on board who are excited about testing something out and providing feedback and being part of that beta, great, all the better. If you can bring them into that process, it's going to make this learning experience for both parties, I think, a little bit better. They're probably going to get a little bit more time and attention from your internal resources because they're part of this tranche of customers going through it. But also, you're going to learn a lot, right? Because hopefully they're going to be very collaborative and their feedback and sharing about, hey, this, this felt good or this didn't feel great or we would have really liked this to happen or we needed these resources. So pulling your customers into any program that you're designing is never a bad thing. Just got to make sure that the right customers and you're setting the right expectations about what that's going to look like, right? Because I'm sure you're going to need a little bit more of their time in order to get that feedback, right? So it's just like a beta program with your, your product. Think about it as a beta program with any of your processes. But some customers really love being a part of that, right? They like having their voice heard. They want to be a part of you and your organization doing bigger, better things. So find those customers and pull them into the journey and make them a part of that experience. The next thing is you've got to map out some points of friction, right? You're going to figure out what those points of failure are. You're probably going to figure that out fast too, um, whether it's your internal teams or your customers sharing that feedback, but pay attention to those moments in time, document them because you got to go back and fix it. And this is what it's all about, right? It's, it's very iterative. iterative. Um, and this is just like all of our programs. I mean, honestly, there's not one thing you should have in customer success that feels like a set it and forget it. Not even your customer segments, right? After any period of time, you're going to have to go revisit these things. So making sure that you pay attention to feedback, not just today, not just while you're designing it, but even months into it, right? Pay attention to signals, red flags, where customers are getting stuck, ways to optimize, listen to your team. Your product will evolve, your processes need to evolve, the market will evolve, your customers evolve, everyone's evolving. Uh, so your processes need to as well. And then also obviously make those changes, execute what you've learned and keep it moving. Um, it's so critical for you to make the changes based on the feedback you're hearing. This is why feedback is important, right? It's the actions you have the ability to take as a result of it. So make sure you're, you're thinking through that when you execute. Now, I'm going to walk you through just a, a few different things that we did when we enhanced the onboarding experience here at Client Success. You know, I always love to share real live experiences of what's worked, what doesn't work, why we're doing things differently than we had been before. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk you through our reconfigured program that we're, we're getting ready to roll out. So our onboarding starts with why. Now, I talked to you a bit about this earlier, right? Like your onboarding program should be really heavily focused on the possibilities that were sold during the sales process or even the marketing process. Um, and so for us, for many of you, if you've attended our boot camps before, you know that we've created these seven pillars, right? These are the seven core business objectives 
of why most of our customers purchase a customer success management solution like client success. They come because they want to democratize data, operationalize process, drive efficiency, mitigate risk, identify growth, increase visibility, or scale. Right. And I'll tell you more often than not, all of my customers go, I want to do all those things. And what we have to do is say, OK, let's pick three to start. Right. One to three always feels healthy. Let's get started somewhere and then we'll continue to grow and tackle all of these things. But we start with this. We make sure that before we start to design our onboarding program, we start with their why. Because what they select here will dictate what the things are that we do during their onboarding program. Right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time building out automation if all of my customer cares about is mitigating risk, right? In that case, I want to focus on the elements of our product that are going to help them hone in on customers who are unhealthy or points of friction, right? Things that are that are causing risk in their book. So I'm not going to focus on the things that aren't important. And that's the problem with most onboarding programs is that they're designed in a way to help boil the ocean, which unfortunately, that is going to slow down your customer's time to value. What I've heard from a lot of customers is we go through, not just mine, other organizations as well, that they go through onboarding. And what happens is they feel like they're doing like 10% of all of the things in all of the parts of the product, but they're not even prepared to do those things because that's not their area of focus right now. That's not the problem they're solving for. So they end up doing all of these things in onboarding, but then they have to undo those things because not the, they're not the things that they needed to do. And when they're ready to tackle them, then it's like the, the data that's in there is garbage, right? So it actually is creating more work for your customers if you're forcing them to do things and focus on parts of your product that are not important to them right now. So our entire onboarding, and this is where our flexibility comes in. I'm not going to tell my customers what we're going to do. I'm going to allow them to tell me what they need to do, and then I'm going to help guide them and say, these are the parts of our product that help support this. So our onboarding now starts with why. Now we start with the what, right? Our onboarding continues beyond the why with the what. Now, let's just say our customers have selected these three things, democratization of data, driving efficiency, and mitigating risk. Now, um, I love a Venn diagram. I love seeing an overlap. And so what this allows me to see is, well, okay, if I know that there's parts of my product that support these outcomes. I wanna see where the overlap is, right? What are the parts of our product that are gonna help them tackle all three of these things, right? This is where I'm gonna figure out how to increase their time to value and help them feel like they're tackling all of these things that they told me were important. So for us, when I think about democratization of data, there's parts of our product like CRM integration, our systems integrations, engagements, revenue manager, NPS that can all help with that. Driving efficiency, it could be, again, our integrations, engagements, pulse, our success score, it could be alerts, automation, revenue manager, and in mitigation of risk, it could be success score, pulse, alerts, NPS, revenue manager, right? So what I can see is that there's commonality in the parts of my product that support each of those pain points. So if I have overlap, how easy is it for me to say, great, looking at this, here's the four or five things that I know that we're going to go through in onboarding to help ensure that our customers are being set up to tackle what they've told me is important. So starting with their why and then leaning in with the what helps you get to that next stage of how. So this is how we continue. Now, once we know what our customers are trying to achieve, and we've lent, we've kind of offered our assistance in guiding them to say, great, based on what you're trying to achieve, here's the parts of our product that we're gonna focus on during onboarding. We wanna help them with the how, how are we gonna get there? So we're gonna talk through our program, right? We do have recurring one-on-one -on -one meetings that are with their designated CSM that follow a very comprehensive plan. And that plan is modular, right? So you can see here, we're using Trello for this example. And what we do is we say, based on what our customers are trying to do, great, we pull in the cards that are associated with the parts of the product that we're gonna go through, right? So it's flexible in the sense that we don't have this project plan that's like one size fits all. No, once we get our customer, we go and we move the cards around and we say, great, here's your custom, your designed onboarding experience based off of what you've told us is super important to you. And here's the timeline that we believe it'll take you to get to the end point of this. Now that's the timeline we're gonna to work towards, but we're here to work with you. Some of our customers wanna move super fast. Some of our customers need to move a little bit slower. Now we make sure that we are helping them move as quickly as possible, but we also wanna be flexible, right? That flexibility is key. We're building out extensive knowledge base like I said, with us, it's all about creating the content in a way that makes sense for them. We've got all new videos that are being produced, guides, um, 
we're trying to create all these like new independent learning experiences um, based on the way that they'll need to consume content, right? Like I said, some of these will be short snippets, like one to two minutes. Some of these will be more robust product guides. Some of them will be these classes that we're doing, our masterclass series, which is hosted um, bi-weekly by one of our senior CSMs, uh, Kristen on my team, who does a wonderful job training our customers, right? Anybody can join those. They're also saved and stored in our knowledge base as a repository. We map out all these resources. So even in these Trello cards, when our customers click in, um, I don't know if you can see here, but like stage three over here, this meeting one, there's 16 things in there. Uh, there's 16 things that our customers will need to do. We have checklists in there, but there's resources for them to go and read and access. And so we're looking at this in a way that really helps them have this experience that's a little bit more tailored. Now, the last thing that we want to do is we make sure that we're very clear on what our next steps are and what those milestones are. We want to make sure that they have full visibility into how we're advancing them through this process. And we're making sure that we're creating those wins for and with them so they feel the progress, right? Because there's nothing worse than feeling like you're embarking on this journey that's never ending. Now, again, ours is very simple. Our onboarding is probably much shorter than, than most organizations, just given the simplicity and straightforwardness of our solution. But I've worked at companies where our platform was so um, configurable, customizable, which created for a very complex onboarding experience. But that can be very daunting if you're not socializing and celebrating wins, right? If you're not helping articulate those milestones. And so we're really big on that is making sure that our customers know when we've had that exciting win and like, great, now we're moving on to that next thing. Um, but making sure that everybody who's a part of onboarding understands what that is and even the folks beyond. And so our when depends. Right. And so this is what we are designing here. Right. We do have a partnership kickoff meeting, which most of you who have attended again, my, my boot camps in the past, we did a boot camp on why we do a partnership kickoff. And that is the very first meeting we have with the customer. We do not jump right into onboarding. We have that conversation first. There's a series of things that also happens in collaboration with that meeting. But this is kind of what frames onboarding. So I'm going to walk you through this quickly so you understand again, this is our flexibility and what it looks like in practice. We kick off with our onboarding alignment. This is where we're setting expectations. We're discussing a program, our core objectives. We're reviewing next steps. We want everyone to always know what happens next and make sure that we have that next thing documented, scheduled, um, wrapped up, right? There's clarity around that. Then we move into our integrations workshops. For us, because of what we do in our product, right? The most important thing that we can do is ingest our customers' data, whether that's coming from flat files, APIs, uh, their CRMs, wherever that's coming from ingesting all that data from all of their solutions is critical, right? Because we're based off of in having that single source of truth for our customers. So everything we do starts with our integrations, right? We cannot move on until all their data is in our platform. And thankfully, based off of a lot of the work that we've done, this isn't that difficult and shouldn't take that much time, but we, we don't want to move forward until that's done. From there, we move to the next three, which I'm not going to need to read these out. They say the same thing. It's module design one, design two, and design three. These are three sessions where we tackle the design around certain parts of the product that correlate back to their why, right? So this is where, again, they're not specific because as a generic side, they can't be. But when we are talking to our customers, what we say is great. In module one, we're gonna tackle this product, this product, and this product in our solution, right? So this is what we're gonna get prepared to configure together. Maybe we can only do one in a session. Maybe we can do two or three, depending on the complexity of the work that, that's required to get something set up. For example, if we're setting up their, their email, right? So that all their emails are captured and we're setting up like their Slack or some other things, we could do a couple of those types of things in one session. If we're building out their success score, which is our version of a health score, Perhaps that might take a whole session because we're ingesting data and we're, we're building out all their criteria and we're doing all the waiting, right? So that might take its own session. So it does, it, it depends a little bit, right? So we try to do this in three design workshops, um, but it could be a fourth design one, right? So it really, again, depends a little bit on what our customers need. And the last thing we do is an onboarding wrap up, right? So once we've gotten through this place where we feel like our customers are set up based off of what we discussed in the onboarding design program, part of our program, right? We get to this onboarding wrap up. We don't move forward until we've had this formal meeting because this is where we can align with our customers to say, are you, do you feel like you are set up to independently use our product, right? And drive value from it moving forward. And until our customers really feel like they are at that place and can say yes confidently, we don't want to kick them out of onboarding, right? Like, okay, let's go back. What, where, where did we lose you? What do we have to go back to go revisit? Are there parts of this that we haven't completely configured with you, right? So we want them to actually tell us 
yes, we are, we're good to move over, move out or no, we're not. And then like, we're going to, we're going to work with them on that. So they're really the ones driving that. Now you probably don't see something on here that I do want to acknowledge, which is train end user training enablement. Now I'm a big fan of train the trainer, but I've also seen train the trainer not go so well. So in our program, we do do end user training where we're going to help our team. Um, we're going to go and train, train the end users of our platform, right? Because at this point, we still know the product probably a little bit better than our admins. Now, our admins, hopefully we get them to a point over time. But at six weeks, I can't expect them to be an expert in our solution. We're still the experts at this point. So because of the way that our program is designed, we do do end user training, but that happens once onboarding is completed, right? Once our customer says the platform is configured in a way that they, their teams can start using a platform to drive value and efficiency and really start to manage their customers, then we can do that training. But I don't want to do the training in advance of that because the platform doesn't reflect our, the leaders that we're working with. If it doesn't reflect their strategy and their workflow that they want for their teams, we've got to tighten that up, right? Because it should, they should, they should be finished in a way that our leaders feel comfortable training their teams on it. So that's what we strive for. So training is included. It just happens after our formal onboarding conclusion meeting. Then we move forward with end user training and we make sure that we've, we've got all those folks. We do it in a three-part series. We do a great job of breaking it down in a way that helps people understand how to maximize the value as a CSM. So benefits of our program, just to kind of wrap this up, it takes into account our customers' objectives, right? It's not rigid. It's not based on our what we think our customers could should or could be doing. Um, of course, there's parts of our platform that we do believe to be somewhat stickier than others. But at the end of the day, what's important to us is what's important to our customers. So their core objectives is really what drives our entire strategy. We focus on value and milestone achievement, not timelines. For us, it's more important that we're getting certain things completed rather than we're meeting some timeline. Um, the timelines, again, are helpful for us to shepherd the conversations and our customers, but we can't hold our customers to the timelines because it doesn't work. There's not a one size fits all. Um, customers will move at the pace that they need to move and you've gotta be a little nimble. It doesn't mean that a customer who's taking a little bit longer, I'm not saying that they're sitting in onboarding for six months instead of six weeks, but if they're taking eight weeks to get your onboarding program completed, you guys should build in a little flexibility if resourcing is a challenge because you have to make sure that you are accounting for the fact that not everything will go as planned. Um, right, even vacations, right? Somebody wants to take time off. They're not gonna be there for a meeting. You gotta push the meeting out. Like things happen, life happens. We align with our customers on their perception of onboarded, right? We don't say, great, you've completed your onboarding. Now you're out of onboarding. We have a formal discussion with our customers that allows them to say, I feel good. I feel comfortable. We did what we said we're going to do. We're in a place where we're going to be successful and we can move forward. Yay, let's go. Um, and then we continue to pro provide assistance, right? We don't stop onboarding our customers ever, right? The product is always changing. It's evolving. It's growing. It's innovative, right? You're always going to have to be teaching your customers how to use your product and how to maximize value and, and use cases will evolve, their needs evolve. So you're always going to have to be going back to those conversations. So for us, we provide continued assistance on platform configuration and optimization. So regardless of what our customers did in onboarding, again, it's not set it and forget it. For some of our customers, they're testing out having a customer success management solution in place for the very first time. And they're gonna to have to figure out all of their own kinks and their own points of friction with their teams. They're gonna to have to learn, we're gonna to have to help them. So we make sure that we're continuing to be there for them in a way that maybe even feels like continued onboarding. Um, so there is, there's a point in time where we do have some formal wrap up of that stage, but when we're in that next stage of realization, we're continuing to support them in a way that helps them drive value, that's our job. So just quickly, you know, I like to leave you with a quick snapshot of either things to do or not to do. Um, these are avoid, uh, onboarding mistakes to avoid if you can, um, starting with number one. So stop using the onboarding experience you designed at your last company and expecting it to work. Like I said, it is not a one size fits all. Please do not assume that just because you built something that was awesome and had fast time to value uh, is going to work the same way at your next company. It's not. Um, take into consideration who your customers are, your product, um, really spend time listening and learning to try to figure out what it takes to be successful. Don't design for a timeline, design for an outcome. Stop focusing on 90 days, 60 days, 30 days. Focus on what it is you're trying to get your customers to achieve. This is why defining what it means to be onboarded is so critical. Figure out what that outcome looks like for your customers and work towards getting them there. The third one, don't design it in a set it and forget it program. Go back and optimize it. Use feedback. 
uh, again, I'm always going to tell you this, please make sure that you are going back and you're editing and you're changing, you're evolving um, because your programs need to evolve. Your product will evolve, the space will evolve, the market will evolve, right? I said this whole little song and dance earlier, make sure your program evolves along with it. You're going to need to create new assets. You're going to create new templates. You're going to create new parts of the process. As you roll out new product, how do you incorporate that product into your onboarding experience? So it's always going to keep growing. Number four, don't ignore lagging indicators. If your customers fail to adopt your solution, dig in, right? If we know that onboarding helps set the stage for your customer's ability to be successful long-term, and what you find time and time again is that your customers are not effectively adopting your solution, right? That lagging indicator of adoption, usage, ghosting you, right? They're not doing anything that looks relatively like a good customer. Probably maybe something happened in onboarding. And it's probably something you should go revisit. So pay attention to that. Don't just pay attention to your ability to say, yep, check the box. Great. They're onboarded. Everyone's happy. They said, yes, great. If they're not driving long-term adoption and value from your product, double click into what may have happened, right? I'm not saying it's onboarding's fault, but go and make sure that you're exploring everything to see where the train fell off the tracks. And lastly, onboarding customers in different segments, industry stages of maturity, they should all look different. Be thoughtful about that, right? Like you don't need to have a one size fits all model in your organization. And we know for certain that there's not a one size fits all model in the industry. So take your customers and who they are into consideration when you're designing this. Figure out what each of those customers needs based on how they look, right? It could be, in, like I said, industry, maturity, um, resources, size, funding. I mean, who knows, right? Depending on who they are, what they are. Um, Think about, does there need to be a different version of your onboarding to help support that? So please lean into these things. Do not make these mistakes if you can avoid them. If you've already made them, it's okay. Go back and fix them. Um, but just hopefully some tidbits for you to take back to either yourself, if you're the leader and you're in control of this, please go revisit. If not, take these internally and share them with somebody who's in control. So um, I'm a minute over of where I'd like to stop. Typically, you know me, I try to give us 10 minutes for Q&A. It looks like I've only given us eight. I apologize for that. But uh, I do think we got through a lot of great content. All right. Thanks, Christy. Great content as usual. We do have some questions. Um, you ready to rock on some of these? Yep. I'm taking my, you know, the, the thing I missed most about you not being with me last week, Dave, when we got to Q and A, I said, I don't have Dave to give me a break so I can drink some water. So exactly. I could build in my own break. So I'm, I am thrilled you're back with me so I can sip my tea. Uh, it's always nice to be the water boy. So thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, let's, let's, let's go on some of these. Right. So, um, one question from Addie was how do you, how do you, what's an effective way to, to hold your customers accountable for doing their part? Um, especially in a zoom, she says, especially in a zoom world where cameras are off, are off and sometimes it doesn't even feel like customers are listening to their training session. So what's a tactful way to keep customers accountable to this onboarding experience and what they're supposed to uh, accomplish. Any, any suggestions there? Yeah, so I mean, this is why I'm super big on making sure that you spend the time to set proper expectations. So we spend the first two meetings that we have with our customers, right? Our partnership kickoff and our onboarding alignment meeting, focusing on what we expect from both sides, right? And our customers are sharing with us what they expect from us as well. When our customers are not behaving like good customers, we kind of go back to that and say, listen, you know, what we agreed upon, we want this to be successful. In order for this to be successful though, let's go back to what we agreed on because this is what's actually gonna help us get there and just have open conversations with them. But if you set expectations properly and thoroughly, you can go back to it. If you've never had that conversation and then they're not behaving the way that you would hope that they would, it's kind of a little bit more difficult. So spend the time upfront to have open, honest conversations about what's needed in order for this to be successful. Awesome. What do you do if your organization, your management team, puts pressure on the customer success team to, to provide very rigid KPIs and especially time to time to onboard. So management team says it has to be done within 60 days. Um, even though you've said here that don't worry about time, worried about outcomes, which is great. Um, what if your management team doesn't agree with that? How do you navigate that situation? Well, I would say, listen, if you feel like your program absolutely can't get done in that timeline, the conversation we need to have isn't about the rigidness of your leadership team. It's about their perception of what the program needs to be. If you find that your customers are not being onboarded in 60 days, go back and share the feedback about that 
and then evolve what that program should look like and then always build in buffers, right? So if yeah. 60 days is not possible, that's the conversation you're having, right? We want our customers to be on board effectively. We're not saying ignore a KPI, have a KPI, but make sure it's the right KPI to support the program that you've designed. So I would go back and have a conversation that looks more like that rather than I, I don't like your KPIs and I just want to focus on outcomes. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't approach it that way. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And then what if, what if another team own, owns onboarding and they're, they're, you know, a technical operations team and onboarding implementation team and CS doesn't have much control there. How can you influence, how can you ensure that, that, that the onboarding is done well versus inheriting a bad onboarding experience? Any, any suggestions there? Yeah. So a couple of companies ago, I was in a similar situation. I led our customer success and, and kind of growth team, but I didn't own onboarding because our product mm -hmm. is very technical. And I will tell you the most, the most effective way I navigated that was to use data from what we were experiencing in our customer base and bring it yeah. back to the leader and enable the two leaders. Like, I mean, me and the gentleman who was running that team, we met all the time, right, as part of our leadership team, and we would just have honest conversations. And I would say, look, here's the data, right? The customers that we're getting, look at this, adoption drops off within 20 days of onboarding, and then we can't re-engage our customers. Yeah. We have to go back and visit that. So I'm always a big proponent of build relationships with these cross-functional teams. That's the only way you'll be successful doing anything in support of your customers is building those relationships. But leverage data. Data is your best friend. Tell a story with that information. Don't go there and say, oh, I feel like, or I think, use data to support that. So if you actually have information that says customers coming out of our onboarding program are not effective, here's why, here's what's happening, and here's how it's impacting our bottom line. If you could even tie revenue to that, people listen. Awesome. Awesome. Well said. Uh, Thomas, I think it was a reference into the, um, the value... Um, statements there's the seven areas of value that you shared oh okay our, our objectives yeah objectives yes. sorry saying i love that i love that i love the customers to share the problems they're trying to solve and that brought them to the software what are your thoughts on having the customer use a numeric value to actually prioritize um the the objective so yeah you're like tell me what is your your primary not just three but uh, do you like the idea of, of having them prioritize them we do we do ask them those. to stack rank them yeah so we do say like help us understand what are the ones that are most important and this also helps guide what we focus on in onboarding right so uh -huh. if they're telling me it's data democratization then i'm just focusing majority of our sessions if we need to right getting all their data ingested making sure this becomes their source of truth for all things customer mm -hmm. right so you could start to prioritize based on what they have prioritized but yeah stack rank because honestly Sometimes you can get to all three, sometimes you can't, but at least you want to focus on the things that are most important to them. Okay, great. Um, last question. Um, and we saw Charlie. Charlie, I had know, a cameo Charlie's back just there. trotting around. That's because the door's open and Adriana That's... just came home from school. Charlie, Charlie <laughs> everybody. Um, uh, Donna Weber talks, I think, about a concept of re, re onboarding or reboarding. Mm -hmm. Is that is that something that's that's important? What's your thoughts on that? Yes. Yes, we do it, we do it all the time. Yeah. I mean, sadly, right? Like listen, you have a new team that comes in place, a new leader, they turn over a team, right? There's a million examples of, of reasons and times where I could tell you that this is a good, good thing to do. But if your customer is not set up to succeed, it doesn't matter where they are in your life cycle, get them to a place where they can succeed with your product. And that means re-onboarding them, re-onboard them. We do it with yeah. customers all the time. We've got customers who have been with us, Dave, like you know this, we've got customers who've been with us for years. Sometimes just the duration of time that they've been with us, we've not revisited enough of the things and the product has evolved so much over time that it's worth saying like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, you know what? We haven't, we haven't touched a couple of these things in a couple of years. Like, why don't we actually just start from the beginning and, and go through this process again to get you to a place where like you're really driving value from all the good parts of the platform. And our customers actually really like that. They embrace yeah. it in a way where it's like, you know what? Yeah, we are ready for a refresh and like approaching it that way. So I think there's no, there's no, reason why you should be afraid to do that. Um, I think the only time it probably gets a little hairy is if your team is not responsible for onboarding and then you're trying to kick it back and there's a lot of resource allocation that can get a little tricky to navigate. But if your team is responsible for it, absolutely do it. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, okay. I think we're out of time, but another, another uh, awesome uh, boot camp is kind of sad because this it is, is sad. Of, of now we have to wait for two more camp. months. Yep. All right, so I have an idea. Can I put an ask out there to everybody who's on this chat? So everyone who's stayed with us this long, um, if there are topics that you'd like for us to cover in a boot camp, 
right? I'm in the process now of designing ours for July. Is this is with May, June, July, July uh, sure. will be our next one. So if you could send me a message, either on LinkedIn, you can shoot me an email at client success. Um, I, find me, message me. But if there's a topic you think it would be really valuable for the community to do a boot camp on, I'm open to hearing your ideas and thoughts. I've got a couple of thoughts of my own, but would love to just continue to create content that everyone loves. Okay. Just a couple of things for all those who joined. Thank you for joining again. We're so grateful to each time that we have to spend with the community. We love it. We hope that uh, this is helpful to you. A um, couple of things. We will be having more. We do have other webinars that, that they'll be scheduled uh, between now and July. So watch for those um, maybe less uh, frequently, but uh, watch for those. For those who are leaders, um, also we have our CS100 uh, Summit, that, which is amazing. It's in September. You'll start to hear a lot more about that, um, but um, that is a, a, a uh, event, in-person event at Sundance Resort for um, leaders. Can we call so, it what it is, Dave? It's not an event. It's an experience. It's, it is an it experience. Is, it's, it's not amazing. an event. It's an experience. <laughs> you'll, you'll love it. You won't regret going. Um, but in the meantime and in between time, if we can help, uh, then please let us know. Reach out to Christy, reach out to myself or any of our team. If you're looking for a solution, we're here to help as well. So thanks for uh, being here today. And we wish you, to we hope you have a great week. Have an awesome week. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.